program. Um, I'm going to turn my video on just quickly so you can see who your presenter is. Um, my name is Grant McCarty. I'm a local foods and small farms educator, and I cover Joe Davis, Stevenson, and Winnebago counties. I work with commercial fruit and vegetable growers that sell at farmers markets and pick your own options and, and orchards. And I also work a lot with homeowners and backyard growers as well. So I'm going to turn off the camera and then I'll turn it back on at the end just to yet again save, save some bandwidth. This is our third webinar of our four part get growing series and we've been certainly very happy to have so many folks join us during this series. This was a topic that I wanted to cover because I find that when it comes to growing vegetables, the raised bed option and the container vegetable option can be very, um, very suitable for for small spaces. And certainly we saw last year that a number of growers came, homeowners and backyard growers came back to growing vegetables and maybe figured out that they just didn't have the space anymore. So they were more curious about growing in containers or even building their own raised beds. We also surely expect that a lot of growers, new folks from last year are also going to be growing again this year. This is also a topic that I have had some experience with. I tend to grow in both of these systems in the raised beds and in container vegetables. And so you'll see photos of those uh, as we go along tonight. Um, a Burbach what, uh, will be able to, um, A Burbach will also put in the chat box a link to the um, handouts for tonight, but you also got those in an email as well. So what, I, what I've tried to do with these presentations is to give a bit of an introduction into kind of each of these systems, but also kind of nail down and get into some of the things that you really need to consider and really need to think about. And as we go along tonight, you'll see a lot of photos of, of my raised beds, which you see here in this photo. We also have used raised beds and containers in the uh, Winnebago County offices along with some raised beds in Joe Davis County. So we certainly have tried these out and, and tried to see what works and <laughs> maybe what doesn't work. So with tonight's plan, we're gonna to get to the basics then. When you're thinking about getting started or you already have them and you need to maybe readjust, what are some things that you really need to consider when it comes to the containers and, and the raised bed system? We'll also get into crop profiles and kind of go through the different crops that you could realistically grow in containers while also addressing some of the things that you really need to consider when it comes to uh, growing in those systems. Um, you'll find that when we get into talking about raised beds and growing, say, vegetables and raised beds, that sometimes there isn't much difference compared to if you were to grow it in soil. But we certainly see some differences when it comes to maybe how many you could grow in a container and yet again would depend on the type of container that you have. We'll talk about raised bed materials and building raised beds and that will further be complemented with container overview. Uh, I have grown in a number of different containers and will shed some light on potentially things that you need to consider when it comes to some of these containers. One of the main areas that I, I hope you take away tonight from is that the growing media, what you actually put in the container, what you actually put into the raised bed, can ultimately make or break the experience of growing in the container or the raised bed. And we'll talk about why that is and what are some things that you really need to consider with this. We'll get into other pieces and then finally end a lot with troubleshooting with some advice from a couple of resources that I have and some guidance too. So you see in this photo here, these are two of my raised beds. These were started last year. Uh, I also have containers in the back and we'll, we'll see better photos of those as we go along tonight too. So when you think about container vegetable gardening, you we really see that you're growing vegetables in containers, right? It seems a very simple statement that, okay, I'm, I'm growing in a container now. But I use the term other because we also see that people have a great experience sometimes growing, say, uh, blueberries or strawberries, kind of that fruit growing experience can be addressed growing in the container. Uh, and so that's something to kind of consider and, and why I say other here too. If you joined us last week for a raspberry and blackberry presentation, you also heard that there are a container type of 
raspberries and blackberries too. One of the things to recognize here too with growing containers is that you're using a non-soil growing media or a potting soil type mix. So you're not going to be digging the soil from the, your backyard and putting it into the container. You're purchasing a particular blend that's going to really allow for this plant to thrive and the plant to grow. What I find with containers is that it does allow you to address space limitations. Perhaps you have moved to a new location and now you no longer have a backyard, but you just have a patio, or maybe you have an area that, you know, you, you're more an ornamental person and you just want some vegetables, uh, you know, maybe it's some herbs or some others. And so of course the space limitation could be nice growing them in containers. It can also allow you to really adapt to problems in your growing area. If you had very compact soil, very heavy clay soil, or some of those things where the soil is just a little bit too hard to, to grow in, you might find the container works well. This is one of my eggplants from last year. This is a Thai eggplant that's growing in a container. Uh, I'll show you kind of what that size of the container is uh, later on tonight. And you notice a little bit of yellowing of leaves, and we'll talk a little bit about that yellowing of leaves too. Furthermore, with container vegetable gardens, you can grow many different types of vegetables. You're not that limited, and there's new containers uh, that allow you to grow those beautiful heirloom tomato plants that you might have thought was kind of you couldn't do because you couldn't find a container. Um, there's certainly squash and certainly vining crops that can also be grown in containers too that maybe previously you were unable to. And with that being said, there's just more and more container cultivars available to you. When you go to a home and garden center or to a nursery, you will find vegetables that may say patio or may talk about the small stature of these vegetables, which are really great for the containers that you're going to use. It also allows you to grow in different parts of your home and backyard. Perhaps you find that there's a very sunny area of your home and yet you cannot plant a vegetable garden there. A container would certainly be able to uh, address that and be able to get the sunlight that it really needs. I also find that one of the things I enjoy is that I can move things around during the growing season. And it isn't necessarily I'm doing this because, you know, the plant is reaching a height and it needs and it has a different uh, planting need. I find I move them because I deal with very small uh, ground squirrels and chipmunks that tend to find my tomatoes. And so sometimes I will start my tomatoes at one spot and then move them to another place if they're in a container. Now, of course, they're still going to find it. They're still going to make their way to those tomatoes, perhaps. But it is something that I do, and that's the reason why I grow in containers. To complement container vegetable gardening, then, is raised bed. And you're going to see throughout tonight's presentation, the RB, that RB you see here is, is just denoting its race bed, as there's some topics that we'll get into that are slightly different um, than what the container vegetable experience might be. So in this situation, the raised bed's created on the soil surface, or it's created in an area that where you're not going to have any contact in the soil, perhaps. Um, it is a much greater area than a container, so it is one that's going to be, we might say permanent or semi-permanent and stay in place for really years to come. And sometimes it's interacting with your soil. Uh, the beds that you see here uh, were created and I utilized um, newspapers as well as cardboard to block out the soil, block out the grass, and then I added my mixture into those beds. So certainly the cardboard and newspaper is going to break down over time, and I fully expect that my roots of vegetables will go into that soil. But for the time being, um, there is an interaction, but you may not have that. You might be growing in an area where you decide to not do that. In essence here too, you know, you're adding a soil mix that's similar to your soil. You're almost replicating the soil above ground. And that truly is entirely different than what a container is. Uh, a container vegetable, which we'll talk about tonight, you typically are discarding that container mix every year because it's really depleted. And you compare that with a raised bed where you've added your kind of base layer, if you will, uh, in year one, and then the next couple of years, you're adding compost, you're adding 
um, you know, good mixtures of aged manure to, to the soil, and you're really trying to replicate the soil above ground is, is really what you're after here with a raised bed. They also tend to have better drainage in the container, but certainly that gets back to the actual height of your raised bed. As the taller they get, sometimes they're much more prone to really dry out quickly. Raised beds, of course, can also allow for just better uh, soil problems, addressing those soil problems. Perhaps you have a compaction issue and you need to address that, and a raised bed would be, would be great for this experience. You could be growing in an area where there's a lot of erosion, and over time that's really depleted the quality of your soil. Perhaps you even are growing in an area where there's just lots of soil diseases or insect pest pressures, and perhaps growing them in a certain area could help you address some of these things. Um, it also typically allows for better maintenance and management because you have a very defined raised bed situation compared to say growing and tilling into the soil. It also is known to increase soil temperatures in the spring. So if you're thinking that you are trying to uh, get your plants out a little bit earlier, it will increase the soil temperatures and that will be very, very helpful for you. It's also useful for limited space. I think that's one of the great pieces here is that you can still get that full kind of gardening and growing experience with a raised bed and produce much more so, much more produce than you might be able to get away with with a container. You see here my raised bed from last year where the frame is and then as mentioned that came in and added layers of uh, newspaper as well as cardboard to lock out um, that grass and then I came in and added my layer of, of uh, growing media. So then what are the challenges then? You, you see a theme sometimes with my webinar series where I tell you all the great things and then we talk about what some of the bad things might be. Certainly for containers, you're limited by that container size. You may certainly find that you're unable to grow as much produce as you want or as many vegetables as you want based on that container size. And when we get into some of those crop profiles, we will talk about a containers that sometimes the size limit means that you're able just to plant one plant. So you see here with the eggplant, this container size means that I can only plant one eggplant compared to growing in a raised bed or somewhere else where I could certainly grow many more. The other thing to mention is that when it comes to container vegetables, we recommend using new growing media every season. The reason for that we'll talk about later tonight, but that is one thing to really consider is that if your vegetables were growing in the container mix last year, we would recommend starting fresh and we'll talk about why that is. There can of course be yield and variety limitations when it comes to growing in containers. Sometimes the yield is just much smaller, especially if you're trying to adapt a vegetable that is uh, very large into a smaller container. And sometimes even the varieties that are container or patio centric aren't maybe as flavorful as you'd like them to be. Containers are also notorious for drainage problems. They drain very frequently. You may find you have to water every single day during the growing season because they're drying out and you don't want them to dry out. They may not also fully address your family's produce needs. Certainly, um, you know, we not everyone in my family loves eggplant, which is why we, you know, if we're thinking that this single eggplant would provide for a family of four, uh, certainly it won't. And sometimes that's an issue to con consider here too. There's a lot of plant nutritional issues where the plant are in a container is able to get the nutrients that it needs. And so you may find that you're having to add more fertilizer throughout the growing season. It can also increase soil temperature, and sometimes that's good and bad, depending on what type of plant you're growing. For raised bed vegetable gardening, certainly there's a space limitation. Realistically, we are stating aim for about a four foot width uh, type of raised bed because ideally we really don't want you to step into that raised bed. If you're stepping into the raised bed, you're potentially causing a compaction problem. So by having a four foot width to your raised bed, it should allow you to easily reach in there and do what you need to do, whether it's trellising tomatoes, harvesting uh, eggplant, um, 
picking weeds, that four foot width should realistically allow you to do everything that you need to do. Um, you may also find future wood replacement is something to consider for raised bed vegetable gardening. And this is especially true in our growing area where we have very cold winters and the raised beds are staying outdoors throughout the winter time. So you may find that you have to do this more frequently because of the challenges of the winter months. Um, growing media can also be a limitation. Certainly we'll talk more about that as we go along tonight, but that can certainly mean why your plants are performing well or potentially why they not, they're not performing well. We usually always recommend having a crop rotation if you're growing vegetables in the soil. And certainly that can be a bit of a limitation depending on how many vegetables you're growing and how many raised beds you have too. It can also be an expensive establishment. Certainly this year with the way that wood prices are, they have certainly increased the cost when it comes to building raised beds compared to last year. I would also stress that not all vegetables will thrive in raised beds. And sometimes you have to really experiment and play around with how you need to set the system up. And yet again, they're pretty permanent. You know, when you think about your raised bed and setting these raised beds up, it's somewhat pretty permanent here, you know, unless you're going to kind of break this bed down. So, I mean, thinking about that is, is really crucial. So then what vegetables are you going to grow? I would say in most situations, most can adapt. You might be able to adapt most of them if you have the right size container, if we're getting that good full sun that many of them really need. You're aiming for good drainage and you're making sure that you're feeding them a fertilizer. Realistically for a container, we're looking at about six to eight inch depth. If you're carrots, if you're growing carrots, you wanna go two inches past the expected length. So if that's a carrot that is going to mature at eight inches, probably we're looking at about a 10 inch depth of your container. Um, when it comes to raised beds, realistically, this is pretty similar. A six to eight inch depth is what we're also after with raised beds. Um, although I'll share that I am right at below six inch depth on the raised beds that you just saw. You'll see a lot of containers out there that are that are pretty big, sometimes five gallons, sometimes 10 gallon. And realistically, you know, is this better? Is this for all your vegetables? Not necessarily. You may find much better success with having smaller containers and matching up container sizes with the vegetables that you're growing. When it comes to growing within these containers, recommendations are yet again based on spacing and certainly the size can really vary. So yet again, we may be looking at making sure that our radishes are spaced two inches between. And when you look at that in a container, it just may not be a lot. So then what vegetables might you grow as we continue this discussion? Um, you know, maybe you look realistically at one gallon starting there and then go all the way up to five gallon size. That might be a good threshold to really consider. Um, the one you see here, this tomato plant, this is actually a 10 gallon size container. So much, much, much bigger. And realistically, I could have half that in half. Uh, it was not needed. I would say that most of the vegetables you might want to consider growing, you're starting about two gallon with about an eight to nine inch diameter here. And that should realistically allow you to grow a lot of different vegetables, but certainly within that container, it may be one vegetable of that particular one, or it may be a couple of them. You might be able to go smaller. That's always an option, but just know that yet again, you wanna make sure the depth is being addressed, that six to eight inches. And you also want to think about the spacing within that container. A question we get a lot of times is, do you need to fill it up? Especially as you look with my 10 gallon tomato container here, I have not filled it all the way up to the top. Um, and the reason for that is it, it will weigh a lot. Um, but secondly, it is that I've got the depth addressed here. And so I felt like I didn't need to, um, to fill it up all the way. If you have plants that have shallow roots, some of our loose leaf lettuces, spinach, things like that, look at diameter. You know, really focus in on making sure that diameter is there that will allow for the plants to really be spread out and really grow. 
So these recommendations are taken from a handout you will get at the end of tonight. And you can see that I kind of started off at the side here where we've got like a one gallon, two to three gallon, three gallon, and then finally a five gallon. And that's really what we see here is that with a one gallon container with say about a six to seven inch diameter, realistically, you could potentially <laughs> get two to three green beans, four to six leaf lettuces, spinach about one inch apart, and then potentially probably one Swiss chard plant is what you could be able to, to grow in it. At two to three gallons, eight to nine inch diameter, you're looking at beets, which could be about two to three inches apart. Carrots, you could put a number of them two to three inches apart. Uh, one eggplant, one pepper, radishes, many that might be one to two inches apart, one cabbage plant, potentially two cucumber plants, although I think you've got to think about your trellising for that situation. The photos that you see here, uh, the one on the left, this is radish. This is in a three gallon container. And you'll note that I certainly need to kind of come in here and, and clean this up, this, um, this three gallon one here uh, on the left. I need to actually thin them and space them correctly. On the right is a two gallon container. And this is one where I have a single cauliflower growing in it. Um, I cannot get any more cauliflower because it's such a big plant. And that should help you maybe think more critically here too, is that you may not have as many as you could really plant, uh, depending on the size. Uh, for three gallons, you could also get away with a determinate cherry or patio tomato plant. So the container on the left would be one where I could probably get away with just one of those kind of small stature, small cherry or patio tomatoes in there. And then the previous slide showed a five gallon container, and that would be your indeterminate tomato. Uh, those heirloom tomatoes, very vigorous growers. The previous slide, that tomato was actually a Cherokee purple. For raised beds, this yet again gets back to the general spacing. So whatever spacing you would realistically be doing in the soil, in the garden, is how you would also be spacing in those raised beds. Um, now, of course, that, that's just a general rule of thumb, a general idea. You then have to factor in you know, different features of that plant. But you can see here, I've got eight tomato plants that are spaced about a foot and a half from each other, about maybe even two feet from, from center to center, and, the, um, and then are trellised uh, among them. So this is a four foot by eight foot bed. I'm able to get away with about eight tomato plants, and they did exceptionally well last year. I had no issues. You do notice that I did, I'll kind of bring up a, a laser pointer and show you, because my depth of my boards is just at about six inches, I actually came in with these tomato plants and hilled them up just slightly. My feeling here was that because I would be directly watering at the tomato plants right at the base that I wanted to hill it up a little bit more just to kind of allow for a better a better root growth growth situation. And that might be something to consider here too, is that, you know, try to fill the soil up as much as you can, the beds rather, but then you may actually find you need to come in and kind of mound that up to potentially get a couple more inches here. Um, you see here on the left here, so in raised beds, I've got, I've got a couple of squash plants. I have four different squash varieties that were growing uh, in these raised beds. Yet again, the spacing was, um, it was a four foot by eight foot. I had four hills basically. And then because of the way that these are set up, the vines then are going out into the garden. So I could of course trellis them, but these are very large winter squash and I needed to certainly knew that the vines of them were probably 10 to 15, 20 feet. And yet again, I try to sometimes push things in the garden, sometimes a little too much. And sometimes of course I, I will lose some. You'll note though that I think one of the challenges here is that when it comes to say a long vining plant, that then will go out into the garden is that it's going to be interacting with your grass. And that's really what I had here with some of my very young plants, uh, young, young squash. And then finally here at the end, you can see the actual yields from this four foot by eight foot bed. So it is for, for candy roaster squash, which you see here. 
Um, I had two Cinderella pumpkins. I just had one Jaradelle. Uh, we had a number of cucumber beetles this last year that tended to really go towards that. Um, so I'd love to have more yield from that. I think that's one thing I have to really step back and really think about my vines. And yet to be able to get as much squash from a four foot by eight foot bed, I was pretty pleased with, especially a first year of trying this out. So what about some of those other ones, like potatoes, for instance? You see a photo here where I've taken a five gallon a uh, felt bag container, I've rolled down the sides, I've planted my potatoes, and these work really well for kind of rolling up at the sides and continuing to add soil. So basically hilling them up is really what you're after here. I think that's one of the great benefits actually with these felt type of fabric bags is that you can actually heal your potatoes up. Uh, you do wanna focus quite a bit on drainage and you also may find that this helps address Colorado potato beetle, which tends to be a walking insect that kind of moves from plant to plant. Um, yields may of course be pretty limited based on size. So that would be something to, re to really consider is that if you're expecting a large yield, lots of potatoes, I frankly found the yields were pretty low compared to um, growing in some of my other raised beds. When it comes to RB raised bed, additional depth is definitely going to be needed. So you're going to have to think about how could you increase the actual depth of the sides, because certainly the raised beds that I showed you that just have about six inches of depth, realistically, that's not going to work well for potatoes. I'm going to really need to increase that to potentially probably 12 inches more than anything. So some of the other ones then, something like melons and pumpkins, um, these could sometimes work pretty well containers. One season we actually, at our Rockford Winnebago County office, we used five gallon buckets with holes at the bottom for drainage and we planted some of our watermelon and it, it grew pretty well. I would say we probably still wanted to fill this container up completely. And yet the idea being that it's just growing, its roots are in this one container and then the vines are cascading outwards from that direction could work quite well for it. Certainly, as you saw with the previous photo though, for melons, for pumpkins, where the vines are everywhere, it's taking up space from a raised bed. And that was just one thing that I really noticed that I need to improve upon this year. If you're thinking about perennial vegetables, so say asparagus, um, rhubarb, horseradish, those are probably not gonna work too well in containers because the longevity of those plants where they're getting maturity, say five years, and then are staying in there for 15, 20 years sometimes, you're gonna find that it's not gonna to work too well for a containers. On the opposite end, they could probably work great for a raised bed. Whether at the end of the raised bed or whether it's just an entire raised bed for perennial plants, you would find pretty good success there. Garlic is another question we occasionally get and you know think, oh, well, could I do garlic as a container? And you probably wouldn't be able to. The reason for that is that because garlic is gonna be planted in the fall and it's going to overwinter in that container, it's just liable to not perform well for you. And in fact, it may actually expose the, uh, the roots of the garlic as it's growing in that container because there's no protection from the outside elements. Um, I currently have garlic in raised beds. It grows great. However, as I look at my planting schedule for the summer, garlic is taking up precious space. I am not gonna be able to harvest my garlic until the end of June. And so realistically with tomatoes, peppers, and squash going in uh, Memorial Day weekend, the first week of June, my garlic is taking up space. And so that's something that I have realized that I'm going to need to plan differently next year because it's taking up valuable space from other vegetables that can be planted there instead. But certainly if you've got the space, if you want to do in raised bed, I found that it works really well. The plants are really thrive and grow. Sweet potatoes would actually be one that we would recommend for a raised bed. And the reason for this or a raised bed or for a container is that they really thrive in very warm soil. 
And for a lot of these containers and raised beds, they're going to warm up much quicker than actually planting in the soil. So as you're thinking about, you know, what would be a great vegetable to actually get started in either containers or raised beds, sweet potatoes would be one that we would recommend. Um, what we encounter sometimes is that as we're planting these, say the first week or second week of June in Northern Illinois, the soil temperatures are just not there yet. And so it is that you're, they're, they're, they're hanging around, they're, they're certainly you know, growing some, but they could be growing much more vigorous if you could get that soil and that growing media warmer. And so this might be the one that you actually look at growing this year in a container or in a raised bed. Um, you might also even combine this with some plastic, laying some plastic on top of the container to increase yet again those warm soil temperatures um, that also would have lots of good drainage in it too. But this would be one that I would recommend. I've grown it, I grew sweet potatoes in containers probably 10 years ago, and it worked pretty well for me. They, they were very massive. It was a different planting zone though, so you may have a much different experience than what I did. Here's a number of varieties that work great for containers and work great for very small containers. Uh, eggplant for one, if you're really into eggplant, there's a number of great ones on the market. This is Hansel, which I, Hansel is an eggplant I grew a couple years ago. Very small, you know, about the length of your, of your, of your, of your finger. Um, very good flavor to it, very good color with it as well. For peppers, you see a number of bell peppers are listed here too. Um, New Ace is a great one. Uh, anything that kind of says lunchbox pepper, that's a one that works really well in a container. Keep in mind that these are still going to be pretty small. They're not going to necessarily be big, <laughs> big ones. I've also included a number of tomato plants that would work pretty well for most of your standard size containers. Uh, patio, anything that mentions patio will be a great one to add in a container. And usually any type of tomato that's going to mention something like bush would also be a great one to grow in a container. As you saw with some of my containers, they're 10 gallons. And yet again, you can go much smaller than that for all the tomatoes that you see here. Uh, Little Sun Yellow is a cherry tomato. I also have a friend who grew, it's called Tidy Treats. Um, it's one that I think is a newer one on the market that can grow really well in containers too. For your squash family, you want to gravitate towards words such as bush, baby, patio. Those are all, all going to grow really well in any sorts of containers because of their small stature and just the way that they're growing too. You would probably need to address a trellis. You might also need to address the vine. Uh, depending on how vigorous that vine is and how far it spreads out. You may also encounter that you need to move them around. And the reason I, I state this is that you may find that based on the, their vining characteristic or, or how vigorous they are, that they just need to be moved around a little bit in that container. For cucumber, I mentioned a couple here. Yet again, you're looking for certain keywords, patio, bush, uh, space master even, that kind of gets away. <laughs> That's a very smaller one. This is Mexican sour gherkin, which you see here in this photo. Very, very tiny. This is just as it started to develop. It's going to get, I think it gets about three times that size, but it's a very, very small um, plant and very good flavor to it. Just kind of, you know, you eat fresh, it doesn't get that big, the, the, um, the, the cucumbers don't. For zucchini, pick and pick is a good one. Patio, gold rush, sunburst, those would all be great uh, to grow in containers and wouldn't be as vigorous as um, some of those other ones. Of the ones that you see mentioned here, these work great for containers. Of course, these would work great for uh, raised beds as well. Some additional things to think about also with containers is, you know, if you have a garden already, but you still want to think about playing around with container vegetable gardening, you could be doing what we call companion planting. So you could be using your containers and actually growing companion plants in them that could help you address insect control. So for instance, you could be growing thyme or nasturtium in a container near your broccoli, cabbage, lettuce, and your beds already, and that could help address some of the insect pressure. 
or maybe you have a container of marigold that's right beside zucchini or basil and thyme. Those would be great additions that could be grown in containers right beside your tomatoes that are in the field or in a raised bed. And the containers will be there to, you know, maybe kind of create a fortress around the plants that you're growing. Um, when you do think about it from a raised bed perspective, you know, sometimes it's just taking up valuable space. These companion plants might be. One other way that I look at containers too is that you could actually grow some cover crops in here. And typically we see cover crops like rye, wheat, grown on corn and soybean fields in the fall and so forth. But containers would also be a great place to grow buckwheat. Buckwheat tends to attract pollinators and you plant it sometimes as you're growing squash and other family members to help with pollination. So I could put a container and just strictly grow buckwheat in it, it would flower, it would help address and bring in some of those pollinators. And it would also be fairly self-contained. That's one of the challenges with buckwheat as it goes to seed pretty quickly. If you were thinking of cover crops on a raised bed, that would be something that we would probably recommend after some years is to get some of those good uh, ingredients back into the soil, which is what a cover crop would do for you. Containers could also be a strategy for trap cropping. Uh, trap cropping is where you basically grow a crop with the idea that it's going to trap insects or it's going to basically be a sacrificial crop. So for instance, blue Hubbard squash, which you see here, um, tends to attract squash beetles much more than other vegetables that you are growing. So they tend to like it more than your other squash plants. So you could put a container and grow blue Hubbard in the container and potentially the squash bugs would just go towards that blue Hubbard and then you would control them. You usually have to spray a pesticide or you trap them in another way. Same could be said for marigolds with Japanese beetles. You of course need to manage it, but you could place them at the border of your growing area in containers to kind of act as reinforcements. This is what I did last year with Blue Hubbard. It was grown nearby my squash, and I found that it did tend to kind of be that sacrificial plant to keep them away from the plants that I really cared more about. So in creating a raised bed, the needs are pretty similar to how you would be growing them out, outdoors otherwise, growing in the soil. It needs full sun for most of the vegetables you're gonna grow. You wanna consider what that permanent location is. And you also wanna to try to make sure it's weed free as possible. Certainly we're gonna do a step to keep weeds from growing up through the raised bed. But if you found that there's a heavy weed pressure area, you might just be a little hesitant and step back to make sure that this is the location that you want, especially if you're dealing with some perennial weeds that might be moving underneath these raised beds. One thing that I might encourage you to do is make it near a water source. These for me are located about 50 feet from my, from my water source. And I find that because of the drainage that I encounter with raised beds, it's a lot of bringing the hose out from the back of my house to water these raised beds because they drain very quickly. Um, it's just a very noticeable thing that I have. And certainly it depends on the year, so we may be in store for a wet season, but I would lean heavy on being near a water source. Realistically, the depth of your raised bed should be about six to 12 inches. Um, I shared with you mine is right at about six inches with these two by fours. If you go up to 12 inches, of course, that's more soil that you need to add, but it is going to allow for potentially a much greater root system to realistically develop. And then again, you would also be thinking when you plant place these on the lawn, you would also be thinking, um, you know, is the root systems of my plants going to be able to penetrate into that actual soil? We do typically recommend about three three by four foot and usually eight feet is typically recommended, but you can go longer than that. You can go much longer than some folks realistically do. I always think, you know, match these up with what you plan to grow. We are a tomato family, so we're always gonna be growing lots of tomatoes. Um, we like to grow squash. We like to grow lots of herbs and other things. So that's why the depth of our raised beds are the depth they are. We're not gonna grow potatoes. We're not gonna grow sweet potatoes in these beds. So we don't need to get them big. 
we don't really like carrots, so we're not growing them and we don't have a depth that's bigger for carrots. So look at that, really, really think about that as you're making them because that will ultimately help you determine whether you need to get a much greater depth or you're suitable with kind of what you have. You will also think about it beyond say the wood material, certainly concrete blocks, stones, even that composite plastic boards are work well for creating this raised beds. You will see kits available to you. Sometimes these are pretty small. They may be four feet by four feet. And when you think about the plants that you wanna grow in the raised beds, it just may not be enough. The additional depth, of course, will mean more soil. You know, as you get more depth beyond that standard wood depth of maybe six inches, you're gonna find that you're gonna to need to add more soil to help. Uh, we were fortunate with the house we bought two years ago, they already had established raised beds in place. The soil is not good quality, it has a very heavy clay to it, and yet it is one that potentially I can grow certain beds in, but I certainly know they put a lot of, of soil uh, in these beds as it was going. Consider, of course, that long term. I, you know, I think that's one of the things to, can, to really think about as you get started in raised beds, and something we've thought a lot about too, is that thinking and making sure the location is where it needs to be, ensuring that this is a commitment that you'll have for the next couple of years. You might even consider too, what's the ease of, of movement if you decide that you need to move this raised bed or which we would not suggest doing it. And yet we recognize that, that's a, that you may have to do that down the road. Um, thinking about replacement, is this wood that needs to be replaced in three or four years? Uh, even wood that might be breaking down some too. And finally, in bold, you see overwintering. I think that's going to be one of the main challenges with any type of raised bed that you create is that they're realistically it may do well for a number of years, but because of the weather we encounter, you may find that it just doesn't work well for you. One of the newer pieces of equipment in the raised bed uh, world, if you will, uh, are the concrete blocks that you see here. Um, I think they're called castle. I think it's, it's a term is called kind of castle. And the nice thing about these is that um, it allows you to just insert the boards. So you're getting the boards the length that you want. You're inserting them to create the, uh, the ends and kind of that diameter of the raised bed. Um, and it's something that a lot of folks are really enjoy because potentially it means you're not have to go and do any cuts, but it also allows you to be pretty creative when you're making some of these raised beds. Um, so you see here in the second photo, it's got about a seven and a half, almost eight inch diameter to it. And then of course the boards are just going right into the insert there. And then you see here at the side, how if you add two of them on top of each other, realistically, you're a little less than a foot, and yet the ease at which you can create a really tall raised bed is pretty quick. One of the other things I really liked about these is that I have an insert here where, oh, whoops, I could potentially put some rebarb in there. Um, I might also even create kind of a trellising system in those holes too. Um, but you can see I've got one of my, we're making a couple of raised beds and I think this weekend, and one of them will be using these. So I may have more to share um, in the next, in the next uh, presentation on, on raised beds. They're pretty affordable. Um, that's one thing that's kind of beneficial is they're pretty cheap too. When we're talking about the raised beds, especially if we're using wood, we do need to talk about what type of wood to use and maybe what type of wood to avoid. Realistically, you know, we're suggesting anything that's untreated, rot resistant cedar. Those are ones that's very common. Uh, they're not going to you know, rot on you. But uh, from Iowa State, one of the guides that, that we suggest and share is uh, has some research on this and suggests, you know, avoid any wood that's treated with CCA, uh, creosote, and, and penta. Um, there's also some other treated options there that you also want to avoid. These wood products would probably be fine if you were growing ornamentals. The issue is you're growing edibles. And so while growing edibles and creating a raised bed, 
it's liable that some of this could be affecting some of your plants. Um, if you are growing some of these or you have them already set up, you've already have this wood, um, or you're planning to, you know, we still recommend a liner, having some liner in place, whether it's a tarp or whether it's something to kind of create a line between the edges of the wood and the soil is going to be very beneficial. There's a lot of other options too, the black locust, the black walnut, which should be fine. Um, the black walnut actual wood is not the going to have an impact on the growth of your plant. Um, it's the actual black walnut leaves and the actual black walnut roots that tends to have an impact on them. You'll find cypress, red cedar, white oak, those would all be fine woods to use. Uh, concrete block stone, lots of plastic lumber as well. I will send you the Iowa State resource so you have this more information. But as you're going to say a home garden center or a place to purchase wood for raised beds, you'll see information there. You know, for instance, in this photo, it's kiln dried, it's heat treated. Uh, it gives me information on the type of species it's made. And, you know, as I shared with you earlier, wood is very expensive. The beds that we created last year um, cost a third of what the beds are going to cost this year. So uh, be uh, look forward to some spending a little money if you're making raised beds this year. For containers, it's a little bit of a different story. You know, there's just lots of different types of containers out there. There's plastic, there's fabric, there's wood, there's metal. I use different mixtures. I use a lot of the plastic ones, but I also have started shifting more to the fabric bags, which are, are the black ones that you've seen and see me show. Um, consider, of course, the diameter. Think about the height. Think about the volume and matching up your vegetables. That's going to make or break your experience. And you may find that you need to fill it completely to get the right depth, or you find that you don't have to fill it up completely too. You see in this photo with our five gallon buckets uh, from home from one of the home garden centers. Um, these worked fine. They yielded fine. I believe this was the lunchbox pepper. So a very small uh, pepper itself too. If you're reusing pots, and this would be great, this would work really well for you, you just wanna make sure that you clean them thoroughly. So making sure that, you know, if you're planting something and you're going to reuse them to grow your vegetables, clean them out with some good soapy water. Uh, you might also even look to kind of rub them down with some rubbing alcohol in the interior, just in case. Um, and then from there, certainly these would work really well. You see here, I planted some knockout roses this past summer, and the pot sizes were, were pretty good diameter, so I decided to actually reuse them for some of the vegetables I was going to grow. So the one over here is a two-gallon one, and that would work well for a lot of vegetables, and then the smaller ones are one gallon. So it would be a little limited in what vegetables I could grow in some of the one-gallon ones, but certainly a two-gallon one could be cabbage could be cauliflower, um, could be even a very small eggplant, would really thrive in that. Even when having and knowing how much actual volume is in there, you want to go back and then look to see what the diameter as well as the depth is going to be. So you see here with this two gallon one has about eight inch and a half diameter. And then the height of it is going to be about 7.5 inches. And that could work really well for for most vegetables. Of course, the one thing to consider is that, you know, it's not the most prettiest looking container. Uh, it's doing its job. Uh, you could put it in a decorative pot, um, but certainly, you know, think about some of those reusable containers you have because those could work really well for a lot of the vegetables that you might consider growing. The felt bags is one that I've now grown. This will be my third year, I believe, of growing in felt bags. There's just lots of different sizes with them. Uh, you see them ranging from one to 10 gallons. The 10 gallon one is the one you see here. And these just allow you to, um, to really move them around. I think that's one of the great benefits is that you've got handles on each side and you can actually move them around to different parts if need be. Uh, one of the other things that I find that's great is that they have 
exceptional drainage. So when you think about a traditional container where the drainage is just happening at the bottom of that container, the drainage is actually happening almost all over when it comes to a felt, a felt bag. So it's coming on around from the sides, it's coming from the bottom, of course. It allows for a better um, air movement too from the sides as well. So it's not just that the air is, is kind of staying stagnant in there. So it just works really well for, um, for containers. Now the challenge though is that it has a short shelf life. Typically what we see with these containers is about three to four years. And if you are using these containers in a way that requires additional equipment, for instance, uh, I staked this tomato. So I had a metal stake that, that was in it. Uh, I did find that I damaged that back. And so um, that was just one thing where I have to get a new, a new one this year. But frankly, they're pretty affordable. You'll find these a lot of, a lot of websites. You can order five, six packs of them and they work really well. Um, it might be ones to really consider to add to your mix. I shared with you, I actually use these with potatoes. So you can actually see one of the nice things is you can roll them down at the side. And because the diameter is also pretty, pretty big too, uh, I have grown all different kinds of herbs, different and even mixtures of different lettuces within these grow bags when they've been rolled down at the side because the diameter is pretty, is pretty wide. Uh, I've also done peas as well and had some pretty good success with it. Um, so rolling down the sides can be pretty beneficial here, and um, it still will work pretty well when it comes to drainage. And yet again, I think the affordability is one of the great features here. Your decorative plants may work okay. And I think yet again, it's going to depend on maybe what you are going to be uh, growing. Uh, you know, sometimes these decorative plants work pretty well, especially if it's a plant that maybe doesn't need as much drainage. Um, you see here this mixture of Swiss chard and rosemary in the center. So you could potentially grow different types. Uh, the challenge though is it's pretty poor drainage. Uh, that's certainly what I have encountered is that the drainage can not be as great compared to some of the others. And you may be better off just not utilizing these or using them in a way that can allow for better drainage. Perhaps you need to add some more holes at the bottom. Perhaps you need to even, you know, some folks will actually kind of fill up these decorative planters with material that will allow for drainage uh, much better too. Um, but it could work and certainly can be used as landscape. This was at the front of our house, so it looked great to have Swiss chard uh, at the front door. Indoor planters, these tend to be more decorative. They tend to be better suited for non-vegetables. So I would probably avoid these. They also tend to have very poor drainage. So you're much better off choosing something that is going to really have a much better drainage and allow for drainage to occur. Um, sometimes the depth is also not really there when it comes to some of these indoor planters. And certainly because most of these would grow and we would recommend growing them outdoors, it's just not gonna work really well for you. They may look really great, but you just may find that the experience of growing vegetables in some of these uh, isn't there based on depth or even based on your width. The five gallon bucket, which you see here would be a suitable one. It would grow really well for a lot of different vegetables that you might be considering. Uh, it tends to have about 11 inch inch width. And because of that, that may actually limit how many of a particular vegetable you're able to actually plant in that container. So certainly you might be able to get away with one cauliflower, one cabbage, one broccoli. Um, when it comes to other plants, such as carrots, spinach, radishes, those you'd want to space correctly. And you may find you're not able to get as much. And yet you've got a very large container that potentially needs to get fill, filled all the way. You also want to store them indoors in the winter. You want to bring them indoors. You don't want to leave them outside. They tend to crack very, very easily if they're left outside during the cold winter. I think one thing I like is I can move it around quite easily. And of course, uh, in this system, I am, dra I am addressing drainage. I've put about 10 holes at the bottom of this container to allow for proper drainage. 
it's still yet again to have drainage issues. And one of the pieces you notice here with this container is that I needed to add much more soil than what's actually in here for this particular watermelon plant. It worked okay, but it could have worked much better if I had added additional soil and growing media to allow for the plant to um, get the light that it needed. But I think the inexpensiveness is a draw here for these five gallon buckets. And certainly if you even think about an indeterminate plant, we've known some folks that have planted heirloom tomatoes in a five gallon bucket because the depth is there. They're able to get all the nutrients that they need. They get all the space they need, but it's just one of them in there. Your plastic planters could also work fine. These would be great, easy to clean. They typically have a number of holes at the bottom to allow for very good drainage. I think the thing to consider is that the width and the height may be the limitation. So you may find that you're able to get the actual, um, the actual depth, the actual depth of the container, but you may not actually be able to get the act, a good width to that. And that's a bit what you notice here is that, you know, the one on the left, is about seven inches, so seven inches of depth, if you will, and yet it narrows a bit. The one on the right, we're saying about six inch depth. And the one on the right is actually what I grew that eggplant in. So the eggplant that you've seen uh, on, a, on a couple of photos, it actually grew in the six inch one, and that was a Thai eggplant. And it worked fine. Um, I didn't have any issues. When you look at these containers, and think more about what you might be able to grow, um, you may not be able to get a lot. It could be that you're yet again getting very small plants or you're not planting as many either. When we look at both of those photos and kind of look at the width, um, you see here on the left from the one previously about seven and a half inches is where we're at. And then we have about eight inches. So this one on the right, uh, eight inch uh, diameter worked fine for the eggplant I was growing. Just one eggplant was able to go in there. I think one of the things I like about container vegetables, it's a lot of experimenting and seeing what maybe is gonna work well this season or what's not gonna work well. And certainly with both of them, they have drainage holes. And that's really what we're really after when it comes to having a good, container vegetable gardening experiences, ensuring that the depth is there, the width is there, and drainage is there. There are lots of other containers out there where you can kind of make your own and you see these kind of self-watering grow box photos here. Uh, what's interesting about them is that they can allow you to, uh, you know, really address the main problem that we sometimes encounter with uh, containers is that there's just the inability to drain and the inability sometimes for them to get the water when they need it. And you see this overview here on the left, and I'll make sure that you have this resource um, where you could grow these quite easily the, in this kind of setup of a self-watering grow box. On the right here is kind of the design for a DIY system, and this is one that is in a five-gallon bucket. As you've seen tonight, the five gallon buckets are pretty adaptable. And in this situation, they uh, are ensuring that the plant is getting the water that it needs in both of these situations. So there's ways to kind of move beyond maybe what we consider kind of that traditional container setup. So the growing media containers, what you're actually gonna put into that container is sometimes where we see issues. This, um, this is one of the things that you have to recognize that if you are starting new containers this year or you have containers from the previous year, we always recommend new growing media every single year. And what I mean by this is that you are, you know, going to the home and garden center, you're getting a bag of that potting soil mix or that container mix and you're pl placing it in the containers. And then at the end of the growing season, when your plants have started to die, you are emptying that container mix out. Uh, folks will place it in their ornamental beds. You could also place it in your raised beds, um, but you need new growing media every year uh, with it. 
there's options. You could purchase your own or you can make your own, of course. Uh, but we want to clarify, you don't want to use your own soil. So you're not going to dig up the soil and place into the actual containers. It's just going to be very poor, poor experience for you. And it's going to be some very poor drainage here too. Lots of ingredients are, are included sometimes in these mixes, peat moss, perlite, vermiculite, compost. They're going to allow for the plants to really thrive and the plants to really grow. Of course, there's also some fertilizer in here as well. The reason that we recommend new media, new growing mix every year is that the ingredients have been depleted. So if you use the mixture from last year in the vegetables this year, you will find that the roots may not be able to penetrate as easily. The water may not be retained as easily and the nutrients will also not be in that growing media that is in the container mix. Um, you're just going to run into a lot of challenges with it. Now, of course, some folks do keep it every year and it works fine and, and that's great, but you have to recognize that a lot of the ingredients that are in these container mixes is to address drainage, is to uh, allow for the plants to really grow and thrive. And I think it's very important to kind of recognize that is that, you know, you want to start off at a, at a good place and the best place that you could do is to have new growing media every single year, that mixture going into your containers. Uh, could you still use last year's? I really don't recommend it. I say dump it into your ornamental flower beds, uh, dump it into a raised bed, that would be fine. We just really don't recommend it. You're not gonna have as a successful season. So you will find things such as the soil is growing mix. Um, they still dry out very quickly. It can also be fairly expensive. This would be your container mix or container blend that you would find at a home and garden center. Um, it has a very low nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, which you see here, which is why we do recommend adding fertilizers throughout the growing season. You could also make your own. So there's a lot of recipes out there where you're kind of combining uh, vermiculite or perlite, and usually you're combining compost. We typically wouldn't recommend combining it topsoil. Topsoil would probably not allow for good drainage because really that's what you're after is a good drainage and a, and a good mixture here. Um, but you still wanna add a fertilizer in here. That's one of the missing ingredients, if you will, if you're making your own. Uh, is that you need some fertility in here, such as the nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium that you see here. For a raised bed, it's a little bit different. Um, it is that you're kind of adding a base layer in that first year. And then from there, you're trying to replicate that soil environment. So it is that you have the base layer, it stays there, and then every year you're adding ingredients. Think of it like you're making a cake or you're making a, a recipe. So last year you had your base layer in, and then this year you're gonna add organic matter like compost, manure. Uh, you would probably be hopefully doing some crop rotation. You would add your fertilizers in there, but you're trying to, to, to make your own mixture. And when I was at the Home and Garden Center this past week, and I was looking through all the bags of growing media, whether it was for um, raised beds or containers, I would flip the bags over and I would see sometimes a big label that would say not for containers. So if it says not for containers, it's not for containers. And that includes it not being good for, for raised beds. So you want to avoid garden soil because the idea with a garden soil bag is that it has an interaction with the actual soil. And a raised bed is not gonna have as great of an interaction with the soil. So you're not after that. Uh, you're not after garden soil, container mixes, or even one that says in ground. You are after a different mixture here for a raised bed. Um, you will see uh, sometimes at home and garden centers, they'll sell mixtures. That's where mine came from. It was a mixture that they had created themselves. And it was a mixture of topsoil, compost. There was also sand in this mixture as well. So that's an option where you could order from a home and garden center. They would then deliver it to you. 
uh, and then you could add it to the raised beds that you're building. You could also make your own and you'll see that the main ingredient for making your own raised bed mixture is gonna start off with topsoil. And there are different recipes out there, just as there are with containers. The one you see here is three shovelfuls of topsoil, one shovelful of compost, mix well, and kind of go from there when it comes to the ratios. So almost 75% is topsoil, 25% is compost. You could also do 50% and then do 30% is compost, 20% is sand to kind of help with porosity. Uh, and then adding organic matter in there too. But you're still gonna need a fertilizer during the season. You're still gonna need to bring something in. And I think it's one of those things to really expect to experiment. You're trying to replicate the soil above ground and there's gonna be some experimentation there. This is a photo from one of the bags um, that we would not recommend for raised beds. Yet again, it says garden soil and a raised bed is not, a, is not suitable uh, to utilize this. Um, so here are just some photos. Uh, you may see some images you're familiar with. University of Illinois Extension does not endorse any particular pro product, just FYI. Uh, I've taken these photos just for educational purposes. So you note here on the left that it mentions it is garden beds and soils for in-ground. So it needs to go actually in the ground. So this is not one that I would recommend. Uh, because a raised bed is going to not be in the ground. Same here, you've got in-ground use. Uh, it's not going to allow for good drainage. It has very low nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium because it's expecting your plants to put its roots into the actual soil. So both the two here, the left and the center, we would not recommend. You will find raised bed mixtures, and you can see that this is the one here on the right that is a raised bed mixture. It's one that allows for good drainage. It does have a little bit of, of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, and yet it still doesn't have enough. But think of this as your base layer and add and go from there. Think of it as this is your base layer. You'll come in with a fertilizer later this summer, um, and then each year you're going to add to it. So some other things to consider here, water and sunlight. This group is notorious for drying out very quickly. You may encounter that you need to actually water every single day, depending on how this plant looks and what the soil and the growing media looks like. You really don't want the soil media to dry completely. That's really what you're, you're after. Regarding how much water, it's typically until the soil ball is moist and water runs through the holes. It's a very simple answer that can really help you determine if you need to water or if you not need to water. And I think because of the container mixes and the raised beds, you'll notice when they're dry much more so than, based on their color, much more so than actually growing in the soil. Most of them are gonna need a full sun. And so a big container you can't move might be your, <laughs> be a little bit of your limitation here. Fertility is something that you want to consider for containers as well as raised beds. And so looking at your mixture, turn it over, see how much that has in, this, has in there, you may find you need to add some fertility. I think that's one thing that we see quite often. And one of the reasons that vegetables grow well or they don't grow well is fertility, where maybe you don't have any fertilizer in there whatsoever. So there would be two recommendations. I would say, look at a slow release. You see one similar here, a slow release formula. And you could do this at planting with your vegetables. And then I would probably come through and do a weekly or bi-weekly of a balanced fertilizer. And a liquid one would be your best bet here. And this seems like a lot, but you also have to recognize that these, these vegetables are requiring a lot more water in a container and in a raised bed. And that in turn is meaning that some of these fertilizers are getting washed out. So it seems like a lot. And yet, because you're watering much more frequently, it means that some of the fertilizer is certainly getting lost from the plant. But that may be why you have had poor success is potentially uh, fertility, especially if you're starting off with some of these container mixes that just don't have a lot of fertility with them. They don't have a lot of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. 
One thing that I would recommend uh, for raised bed situations is to maybe don't overdo it when it comes to your fertilizers. I know that this was something that I encountered last year when I purchased a raised bed mix. Um, it came from a home and garden center. They had made their own. It was very high quality. I planted beans and I continued to fertilize the beans and I over fertilized my beans and they did not flower until mid August. Everything else did fine. All my other vegetables did fine, but potentially the beans got too much nitrogen and I didn't realize it because I just assumed that the raised bed mixture didn't have a lot of nitrogen in it to begin with. So troubleshooting, you know, this is kind of, as we get wrapped up tonight, one of the main challenges that we really encounter with this group. You know, if you've got an issue, look to see what you can address. This could be drainage. This could be that you need to move it, it needs more sunlight. It may be that you're unable to address it. Perhaps it's a container size issue. I would say that one of the things that you might see a lot of is nutrient issues. This is cucumber plant, which you see here. It was really great growing for me, really green color, and yet it has yellow, and yet it's kind of declining. Um, realistically, it was under stress, and I suspect it was a combination of nutrient issues where it didn't get the nitrogen that it needs, but also drainage issues where I was letting this plant um, go too frequently without enough water. And so it's stressed, it's stressed at this point. The way that I adapted and tried to recover it was to be more frequent with my watering and was to increase a little bit more with my fertility so that hopefully both of them could keep this plan and get this plant back on track. And I was pretty happy that it, that it realistically did with it. So that would be something to kind of notice is that if the plant vigor is slow, if you have any yellowing discoloration, it could be nutritional issue and it could also be you know, some drainage issues. You will have a handout of this chart, but I just want to show you a bit more of what this looks like. Uh, from Texas A&M, they have a great idea of just kind of laying out, you know, if you see certain symptoms in your container of vegetables or in your raised beds based on these descriptions, potentially these are the causes. And then this would then be your corrective measures. I really like this guide just because it tends to kind of lay it out for you while addressing some of the main challenges that you might encounter here. And you'll note that sometimes, you know, the yellowing from the bottom, poor color could be both excessive water as well as low fertility. And so determining which one that is might be a bit more of a challenge. But of course, you know how often you're watering or if you're not watering at all. But I would certainly really look more critically at your fertility and your fertilizers because the container mixes just do not have enough fertility for our vegetables. So we're starting to wrap up tonight. Um, I have all these resources I'll send your way, a couple of which are already in the box folder uh, from the link I sent you, but you'll have access to all of these links uh, and I'll send them your way probably tomorrow. I did a webinar a YouTube series last year, a very quick three and five minute videos uh, in my growing area. So you can, and I will send that along with you so you can actually see kind of what I was encountering and how I was growing vegetables this summer. This one here is the blue hovered squash. So that was the one I mentioned that was my sacrifice for squash bugs this season. Um, but you'll get a link to this one as well. Uh, so one more webinar next week on weed management in the vegetable garden, one that has been highly requested for years and years in our unit. And so we're very happy to finally be talking about it next week. And then Bruce Black's series continues as well, growing horticulture in Northwest Illinois with strawberries on May 12th, and then creating bottled terrariums on May 19th. So as we get wrapped up tonight, please go ahead and put some uh, questions in the chat box. I think some of my main takeaways would be, you know, really think about what your family needs are to really determine how many you need. You may find you just don't have enough for what you're thinking of doing when it comes to containers. And certainly you may find you have enough. Um, for our family, our three beds work really well, but 
you know, I'm about to add two more beds <laughs> because I can't stop adding raised beds. That's the, the condition I'm in. Consider choosing your plants wisely. Really think about spacing correctly. I would say the one takeaway too I would mention is don't let containers and the raised beds dry out. That's just one thing that will really put these plants under stress and really cause some problems. If you are growing in containers, use new growing media this year. If you're growing in new containers, use new growing media. If you've got a raised bed, you want to think about adding ingredients. So you need to add compost, you need to add aged manure or bags of manure that you see commonly. Uh, those would be two, that would be something that you want to consider adding this year. Expect to troubleshoot. That's one of my lessons I've really learned over the last years that I have been doing containers and raised beds is I do a lot of troubleshooting. And because I like to do that, I, 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 I'm okay with it. But experiment and adapt and frankly, just have a lot of fun. Uh, you see here in my, my tomatoes that I have harvesting sun gold tomatoes and we'll still have more sun gold this upcoming year. You also know that I'm doing something that I would not recommend. I don't really recommend you stand in your raised bed. So do as I say, not as I do, if you will. So that's my email. That's my phone number as well. Uh, if you have any additional questions uh, after tonight, I'm going to turn my camera on and I am going to answer some questions. All right. Da, 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 da. All right, so there's a question from uh, from Judith. Are you mulching the raised beds? Um, I'm not mulching the raised beds. It is possible that you could, you know, when you think about especially weed management, you could put down a mulch layer and then you could come back in and put where those, those plants are and then cover it up. So mulching could be an option from a weed management perspective. You might also even think about when you overwinter a raised bed, you could put down leaf mulch. You could also even put down some straw. And I realistically, that might break down and be a good ingredient to add to the raised bed. Um, certainly would protect the soil between the winter and keep and kind of close that fallow period as well. Uh, there was a statement I found that planting the garlic around the raised bed to tear the rabbits and the deer. Uh, I haven't heard that. So it certainly could be kind of an option to keep them away uh, from, from it. I think that's also another great point with raised beds is to you know, think of their location also from a mammal perspective. You know, I try to keep some of my raised beds a little bit further away from the house, specifically because I have a very small mammal population around my house. So closer to my house than containers is leafy greens and other things that I know the small mammals won't go to. Further away uh, is tomatoes and squash and others. Uh, Dave, question, question from Dave, where are you finding your seeds for the plants you've mentioned? For many of the ones that were mentioned, you're gonna find them through uh, those standard seed catalogs that, that you might know of. You may find them in burpees, you may find them in Seed Savers Exchange, a lot of those varieties also mentioned will be found at home and garden centers as well. They'll be started as transplants. And that's a pretty limited list. There's always lots of new ones on the market. So you may try start locally at home and garden centers and kind of go from there with it. Uh, there was a statement. Uh, we have, a, have one that's a little bit deeper, about 14 inches, so we don't have to bend over as much to plant or harvest since we are getting older. And that's a great point, John and Cindy. You know, the, a much greater depth is going to be a much more pleasant experience to harvest and grow from as well. You know, I'm, I'm <laughs> mine is smaller just because I'm able to do it, but I think certainly long term, a higher depth can be much more suitable to grow from. Yeah, someone someone mentioned in the comments about cedar planks. Things are very expensive for wood. Uh, this is this is what we're we're encountering just yet. And as I shared with you, um, the beds this year for two beds, it's going to be uh, probably three or four times the amount uh, of of price uh, this year 
compared to three beds last year in the wood that was used and then the same shape. So expect some sticker shock when you get here. Um, yeah, so I am growing in Champagne. I'm sorry, I'm growing in Northern Illinois. I'm up in Rockford. So that's where I'm, I'm growing in. Planting zone 5B is where I'm located. All right, Carmen asks, could you mention the stamp on the palette not to use? Could it be used to build a, uh, a compost uh, box? Also, I have grow boxes of self-watering kind. How many tomato plants can I put in them? So your, your first question, um, you know, when you're thinking about some of these raised beds, you may find wooden pallets. And these wooden pallets would not be, would be, you, if you're, getting wood pallets and they're free wood pallets you want to be a little cautious of of getting that sometimes they have a treatment on them methyl bromide an mb which is what you want to avoid anything such as kiln treated or heat treated the kt or the ht would be suitable and would work fine for growing in um creating kind of a container and that would also be fine for kind of creating the corners of a compost bin as well. So you want to avoid the wooden pallets that have the MB. Uh, still be very cautious of what you're getting. You know, I think that's one thing to really consider if you're making a compost bin and using those pallets is just make sure that they're, you know, as good quality as you can with them, but you want to avoid any that have an MB for methyl bromide. Uh, your follow-up question was, I have grow boxes, the self-watering kind. How many tomato plants can you put in them? So I would go back to what the spacing of those tomatoes might be. And realistically, for a lot of the tomatoes, we're looking at about a foot and a half spacing. For some of the small tomatoes, you might be able to get away with at a foot. It might be where you're at. You know, some of those very, very tiny patio tomatoes, you might be able to get away with a foot spacing. So that's what I would probably start with, you know, at potentially start out about a foot and a half. If it's a smaller one, maybe you're at about a foot with it. Uh, question, uh, what about corn in grow bags and containers? Corn is gonna be one of the challenges. It's one of the few vegetables that we grow that is wind pollinated, and that requires a much bigger growing area than maybe what a container is going to be able pro to provide. When you look at my raised beds, they're about four feet by eight feet. I could potentially put my corn in that four by eight feet, and that should allow for some really good wind pollination distribution. However, it may not be as much as I want to expect or how much my family really needs. And so that would be the main challenge with trying to adapt the corn to a container is that you would need a very big container in order to get away with it. There might be some very unique varieties that are much smaller ears that might be able to do it. But if you're thinking of traditional sweet corn, your spacing is not gonna work well in a container for corn. Question, uh, if I dump my last year container soil into my raised bed, do I need to be concerned about transferring disease into my raised bed? Uh, that's a great question, Mary. Probably not. I think the only thing to consider is, you know, if you were dumping this mixture into that raised bed, would be if there was any leftover debris of plant material or, or roots. So you might try to remove those. The other thing I might suggest is that if you had that raised, that container mix that went into the raised bed, I would probably try to avoid the same families. So if it was a container mix and you grew tomatoes in it, I wouldn't then put that mixture in a raised bed where I was planning to do tomatoes or planning to do peppers. I might put that mixture into a squash, uh, the squash, uh, a squash uh, raised bed, for instance. So that would be the only thing is like almost treat that container mix as if it's a kind of crop rotation, perhaps. Uh, statement, I reuse my media for several years before changing it. I mix a mushroom compost each year. I haven't had a problem in 20 plus years. I've been growing in pots. My only problem is critters that chew holes in my veggies. And that's a great point. And, you know, I think you bring up a great thing that's like, you could probably get away with it. 
but you want to think about an ingredient in there. And what you're doing where you're reinvigorating with mushroom compost is helping out quite a bit. And that's addressing the nutrient needs that the, the container mix is depleted of. And you're probably doing a lot of other good things too, especially if you're in crop rotating. Uh, there's a question from Lee, what about using Epsom salts or eggshells? So we don't recommend Epsom salts. It, it actually doesn't do too much when it comes to addressing some of the fertility needs that your plants might be encountering. You're much better off using some other ingredients and other fertilizers than the Epsom salts. Um, for eggshells, you know, sometimes folks will use the eggshells for calcium. Yet again, you know, your fertilizers should have some calcium in the soil and they would also have um, those other fertilizers would have them too. So I would say neither one of them would, you know, at this point would be um, uh, recommended. If you've done this and you keep doing it and you like that, then, you know, we kind of stay and uh, say that that's okay to keep doing it. But I would say that many of your fertilizers and the soil itself will have those nutrients that the Epsom salts would have or the eggshells would have had. Uh, <laughs> Lee, Lee's question. My dad wants to use his lawn for fertilizer on tomatoes. It's three to one starter. I say no, help. Yeah, I mean, I would say that you're gonna be much better off um, growing and utilizing a fertilizer that's balanced. And the reason for this too, and I think this is what you could tell your dad, Lee, is that you know his lawn fertilizer is just for leaf production, right? your tomato is going to develop fruit. It's going to develop seed. And so it needs an entirely different fertilizer than what that lawn fertilizer is going to have because the lawn fertilizer is strictly going to be for leaf production. But your tomatoes, they need a fertilizer for, uh, for seed and for tomato development that they're not going to really get from a lawn fertilizer. I hope that's a good reason. I hope that's a good enough <laughs> reason to, to tell them not to do it. Uh, Lori had a question. Um, Laura, I'm sorry, Laura had a question. I had someone mention using gypsum in the raised bed soil. It can sometimes be used, you know, I don't, it would just be another ingredient, if you will, in that raised bed. So it could be something that could be addressing, you know, building up that soil, just another addition to diversify it. But I would say that you might be better off with other ingredients than, than the gypsum. And yet again, it really depends on what your base layer start was. So, I mean, if you went to a home and garden center and they had an exceptional, you know, raised the bed mixture that they provided for you, you could get a soil test from it and you may find you don't need to add gypsum or anything like that. Um, you may instead decide to do compost or manure or some other ingredient. So I would chalk up the gypsum as just another organic matter. It could be that sure you do it this year, but you want to think about other ingredients. So you want to go back to compost, you want to go to aged manure, you want to go to something else in there, potentially.